Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, if Labour is to recover from the Copeland by-election defeat, the low poll ratings and the soft coup and the infighting, the party must persuade voters that it can be trusted on the economy. John McDonnell, the shadow chancellor who spent last week looking over a cliff, joins me now. <laughs> what did you see at the bottom of the cliff, John McDonnell? Well, I saw that. It wasn't the way to go anyway, and I think most people in the party saw that as well. We need to unite, and that's what's happening. I don't know if you had a chance to watch last week's show when we were talking to Patrick McLaughlin and I mm. put him the Resolution Foundation figures for income distribution yeah. over the course of the rest of this parliament. Basically, the bottom 60% or so forth have a really tough time coming, as things are. What's Labour's plan to help them? Well, the, the latest prediction as well is on the government's own forecast now. House of Commons have checked it out and people lose about £1,100 as well. Um, we're the only economy in Europe that's growing while wages are falling. So it's very clear what we have to do. It's very, very, very clear. First of all, well, people need a pay rise. We believe that there's a squeeze on living standards, and we believe there should be a real living wage. That's £10 an hour. We also believe that they need help with costs. So, yes, capping energy costs. We believe actually bringing rail back into public ownership will help us on reduced fares as well. But also we need to address the difference between men and women, we've still got a gender pay gap in this country, which is scandalous. All of those things can come about if we have a fair taxation system, if we tackle, ta well, we can tackle tax evasion, tax avoidance, which is on an industrial scale in this country, end the tax cuts to the rich, as we've seen under the Conservatives, and to the corporations, and invest and grow our economy. This is not rocket science, this is basic eco economics. Something slightly strange is going on, which is that um, your messages on all of that and on the NHS really and on social care are really popular, yeah. but the party is not popular, and that is probably because people don't think it all quite adds up. So can we go through some of the numbers? Sure. And can I start by asking for the definitive John McDonnell answer to how much the NHS now needs? Right. The, the independent estimates now on NHS and social care is between 8 and 12 billion. We believe that the government now have put aside, as is reported, 60 billion increased tax receipts in January have contributed to this as well for a crisis in case there's Brexit. The crisis is here now in our social care and NHS. So we shouldn't prepare for Brexit? Well, we should prepare for Brexit, but some of that money now needs to deal with the crisis of the NHS and social care. It is a crisis. So there's 12 billion for that. Let me run through a few of the other things. There's the cut for disabled people, which you have attacked as a very cruel cut, the £3.7 billion on personal independence yeah. payments. Presumably, you would replace that. Well, what George Osborne did last year, when he was reversed on PIP, he absorbed that money into the overall budget and contingencies. We'd expect the government to do that as well. He absorbed that. He found the money within contingencies to do it. We'd expect him to do that. This cut, remember what this is. This is 160,000 the most disabled mm. people in this country. Sure. The mm. courts have ruled it's against the government. Alzheimer's, it's people exactly. with Alzheimer's. The courts have ruled against the government. They've got to address this issue. We cannot allow these people to suffer anymore. All right, let's move on. They also want to reverse the cuts to universal credit and employment support allowance which um, your office suggests is going to cost you £14.5 billion pounds by 2020. We'd look, at, we'd look at two things, basically. We'd look at making sure we reverse the corporation tax cuts and we'd look at a fair taxation system. We'd look at tackling, yes, tax evasion and tax avoidance and we would be growing the economy as well. As we, as we go forward now, we'll be publishing in detail all our tax proposals, obviously as we move towards the general election well, itself. Sure, I but won't the, the overall principle about this is that we've got to have fairness back into our economy. That's why, I, that's why I'm saying the wealthy and others should be, and corporations should be publishing their income tax returns so we can see sure. whether there's fairness or not. You said just now that the country needs a pay rise. That presumably goes to public sector workers. You said that you're going to end the current freeze on public sector pay. Now, if you go up by 1%, that costs you £5 billion and so forth. How much are you going to lift the cap on public sector well, that will by? Well, that will be part of the negotiations. All these but things... presumably by inflation. Well, we're looking to see what will come out of the negotiations. What we want to do is make sure living standards are not eroded in the way that they are now. And, you know, when you do that, what does that mean? It means people get a pay rise, of course, and they can... We've got, we've got the moment... Six million people living below the living wage. We've got four million children in poverty. Two-thirds of them are in families where 
people are at work. So the wages are just not coping with what people's needs are. Right. So do you think that, should, that pay rise should be pegged to inflation? Let's come back to the original well, question. We believe, it should, we believe it should make sure that people are not losing out in the economy. That means, yes, matching inflation. But there are areas, there are areas where negotiations will settle at pay rises which are fair. I'll just give you this example. When, in the 1990s, I can remember campaigning saying that the directors of FTSE 100 companies were earning 50 times the amount of the average pay. We thought that was a scandal. That's now 180 times. We've got a grotesquely unfair society. So there's society. huge inequalities to be addressed, but I'm still spending, um, going through the spending commitments because you also want to restore maintenance grants for the poorest students and bring back the educational maintenance allowance for 18-year-olds. And that's another 4.5 4 billion. I'm just saying this is, this is we, beginning to well, add up a bit Let's here. talk about how much has been given to the corporations. We're talking about 70 billion has been given away in tax to the corporations. Uh, where does this figure 70 billion come from? Because... Um, if you restored the uh, corporate, if, if you didn't cut corporation yep. tax, between uh, now, that, that's seven well, billion, not seven. Well, between billion. now and 2020, the reductions down to the levels that the government wants to raise is 70 billion. If it goes to tax it's, haven, it's, sorry, it's seven billion, not 70. It's seven it's billion a, a year. If you add up the corporation tax cuts, the cuts to capital gains tax, the cuts to the banker's levy. The cuts to the inheritance tax, it comes to 70 billion. So you're adding and all then, these things in. Yes, as well. of course. And then, if you look at what Philip Hammond threatened, which is to go to a tax haven Britain, so Irish levels of corporation taxes, okay. 120 billion. Well, let, Can't let, be let, acceptable let's in unfair society. Let's put those, th those prospects to one side slightly and just ask you about two other things. Scrapping tuition fees, is that that's something Jeremy Corbyn talked about in both of his leadership campaigns yeah. quite a lot? Is that still on the cards? Yes, it is. And we'll be, looking, we'll be looking at our tax proposals in the future about how we can afford that. But a big essence of this, you know, is if we start growing the economy again, if we start investing in the economy, we'll grow the economy, we'll be able to afford the public services that we need. The problem but that we have at the moment, the economy is not growing it on a scale that we want it to, but in addition to that, the rewards of that growth are not being distributed fairly. That's why so in a sense, we have, you have to say point. to people, cross your fingers and no, trust us. All. We will grow the economy so fast we'll be able to no, pay for not these spending all, Not at all. What we're saying is we'll have a fair taxation system, we'll tackle tax evasion and tax avoidance, we'll make sure there's no longer giveaways to corporations and the rich, we'll invest in our economy and grow the economy, and on that basis we'll be able to afford the public services that we need and we'll also be able to afford fair wages. It's, it's basic economics. This is sound common sense. Okay. What was the soft coup? <laughs> it, was, it was a number of people, I think, stirring in advance of the Copeland by-election and, and the Stoke by-election. You talked about plotters. You were clearly talking about more people than Peter Mandelson, who was sitting there and with whom you're now having tea, and Tony yes. Blair. Who are you talking about? Well, I think you say what so Peter Mandel said that week. He said, every day I do something to undermine Jeremy Corbyn. I make a phone call, send an email. There must have been people on the end of that line, at the end of that mm. email chain to receive it. Actually, what's interesting, as I say, I think we've all looked over the edge on Copeland and we've decided we need to unite the party now. And yeah, I will be having a cup of tea with Peter Mandelson. There'll be lots of things we agree upon. There'll be dis some disagreements. But I think the most important thing that we've got is responsibility to our party, but more importantly, to the country. Would you go as far as to have a cup of tea with Tony Blair? Of course. I wouldn't talk to anybody. We need advice from everybody. But we've got to get... So literally, I, I, you, you're the, holding your hands out to progress in that wing of the party. Of course I am. And I've said I'm happy to go along and talk to progress at any stage as well. Why? Look, I was on a march yesterday with NHS workers, nurses and doctors, and people campaigning all around the country. And that Jeremy Corbyn. Yes, and Jeremy Corbyn. And we were there. Why? We were there to listen to people. On social care, our social care is in absolute crisis. The government's cut four and a half billion from social care. Elderly people are not getting the care they need. They're winding up at A&E. They're then being treated on trolleys in hospitals. Then they can't come out of hospital because the social care is not there. Could, oh, we've sorry. got to unite the party to provide an effective opposition so that we can then form a government. I think Tony Blair, Peter Mandelson, myself, Jeremy Corbyn, all of us in the party realise the responsibility on our shoulders. And we're going to bear that and we'll work together to do that. And whether you like it or not, all wings of the the party are looking towards next generations of leaders. You've talked about yeah. various people and the other side have talked about various people. Everyone's grooming people. How important is it, the so-called McDonnell Amendment, to lower the threshold? <laughs> yeah. It is important. Oh, it is it's important. got your name on it because oh, you tried to stand for leader and couldn't because of the MPs well, to allow more left-wing figures to, to stand. How yeah. important is that? Look, let's get this clear. I want to be absolutely clear. John McDonnell will not stand for the Labour Labour leadership ever in the future again. Full stop. That's I've made that clear time and time again. I've campaigned for lowering the threshold for years. 
but it's not that significant to me because Jeremy Corbyn will lead us into the next election. Of course, we're building up a succession for the long-term future, and we've got some really great young talent coming through, but they need more experience before eventually they will succeed. Jeremy will take us into the next election. This amendment is part of the debate within the party, and that will be decided at conference, but it's not a big issue. And what, what about the, um, all those people on the other side of the party who'd like to go back to the original selection system? The, you know, the, yeah. the moves that the party can't... I understand, I understand. But look, we've got a huge party now, you know, half a million new members, largest political party in, in Western Europe. I think our members don't want to go back to where there's just a small group deciding who's the leader. They want a democratic say, and I think that's the future. We're a democratic party now, engaging people, building, well, building within communities as well. And I don't think people want to ever go back to where decisions are made just by a small elite group. John McDonnell, future leader or not, come back again. Thanks very oh, much well. for talking to us. Well, I'm joined now by Philip Hammond, the Chancellor, who's going to deliver his famous red box from Downing Street to Parliament. First budget as Chancellor. Within a couple of weeks, the Prime Minister, meanwhile, will trigger Article 50 and begin Britain's exit from the EU. And yes, folks, those two things are connected, and the Chancellor is with me now. Can I start, Philip Hammond, by asking about these reports that you're going to do something big for training? Because I'm a wizened old sod, and I've been around for many years, and every Chancellor announces he's going to do something about productivity and training. And out there in the world, nothing quite happens. So why is it going to be different this time? Well, we've got two big agendas. One is building an economy in the UK that works for everyone, making sure everybody has a chance mm. to achieve their potential. And the other is preparing Britain's economy for a global future after Brexit. Both of those agendas uh, imply that we need to do significantly more in training and upskilling uh, our young people. So yes, it is a priority for me. In the autumn statement, we focused on uh, capital investment in our infrastructure uh, but if you talk to anybody operating uh, in the economy they will tell you uh, that the other thing we need to address skills is shortage. skills so it's a high priority uh, and I advise you to tune in on Wednesday and see what I have to say about and it. And are we all going to be talking about T levels rather than A levels in the future is that your hope? Well I think the important thing is that we've got to establish genuine parity of esteem uh, for some people they will study A levels at school and go on to um, higher education and academic uh, route. Others will decide to take a technical route and what we need to do in this country that others, the US, Germany have done years ago uh, is create a technical route which is as rigorous, as clear in the qualifications that are achieved and as well understood by young people and employers as the academic route is. According to all the briefings today you're spending half a million pounds on this which isn't a lot of money, F sorry, 500 million pounds on this. Still not a great deal of money to perform a huge revolution, a huge transformation. Is it, is it really a big deal? Well, Andrew, as I know, um, previous chancellors will have said to you on this programme, I'm afraid I'm not going to set out the detail they of my budget. They all tell me everything in it, the budget. That's terrible, isn't it? I'm, I'm not going to set out the detail um, here this morning, but I do acknowledge that skills is one of the big issues uh, that the government needs to address. Are you concerned that, again, we're talking about briefing and economists and so forth, that <coughs> almost everybody thinks you've got plenty of money to spend this time, that thanks to higher than expected tax revenues, Philip Hammond has a fat lot of money in his, in his wallet? Well, first of all, it's, it's not money in the wallet um, because we're borrowing uh, a huge amount of money. Remember, we have over £1.7 trillion pounds worth of debt. We're spending over £50 billion pounds a year just on paying the interest on our debt. That's more than we spend on defence and uh, overseas uh, aid together. So this isn't uh, money in a pot. Um, what is being speculated on is whether uh, we might not have borrowed quite as much as mm, was sure. we were forecast uh, to borrow. And we'll see the actual uh, numbers uh, on Wednesday. But Andrew, if your bank uh, increases your credit card limit, uh, I don't think you feel obliged to go out and spend every last penny of it um, immediately. I regard, Depends on your temperament. I, I regard my job as Chancellor mm. uh, as, as making sure that our economy is resilient, that we've got reserves in the tank, so as we embark on the journey that we'll be taking over the next couple of years, we are confident that we've got enough gas uh, in the tank uh, to see us through that journey, and that seems the sensible way to approach and it And this to me. has been described as battening down the hatches, ensuring that you've got, as it were, windfall money in your back pocket should you need it. And in terms of the scale of this preparation fund, as it were, the Sunday Times is talking about £60 billion. We're talking about a lot of money, just in case things go wrong during the Brexit period. 
Is that right? Well, uh, I don't think it's about the Brexit period. I think any Chancellor sure would be sensible to try to make sure uh, that he has enough flexibility um, to manage the economy on a day-to-day -day basis um, as we go forward. What assumptions are you making about the divorce payment as a result of Brexit? I mean, we hear these huge figures from the continent about 40 billion or 60 billion, and here we've got the House of Lords Committee and your own legal advisor saying, no, we don't need to pay these people a penny. What's your own feeling? Well, I think my feeling is that we're about to uh, enter into a negotiation and mm -hmm. uh, very often you will have noticed, mm -hmm. Andrew, that when you're about to start a negotiation um, with people, they set out very large uh, demands and very mm. stark positions ahead of that and, and obviously somewhere in the middle uh, obviously this is a, a piece of negotiating strategy that we're seeing um, in Brussels but the Prime Minister uh, has been very clear we're a nation that honors um, its obligations and if we do have any uh, bills that fall uh, to be paid we'll obviously deal with them in the proper way can I ask what sort of area of money you're looking at in terms of preparing to pay bills to the EU? Well, I'm not going to speculate uh, about amounts uh, other than to say that we are a nation which abides by its international uh, obligations. We always have done, we always will do, and everybody can be confident about that. Because it's not just about obligations and the law, is it? It's also a negotiation, as you said, and if we are going to get frictionless and free access to the single market, which we desperately want, then we might have to pay for that. That would be part of the deal. We've got the money, they've got the market access. And that is well, where the deal will be. We'll be leaving the European Union, we'll be out of the single market, and we don't expect to be making large payments in future. But we may choose to participate in some uh, programmes or some areas of activity with our European neighbours. And if we do so, we'd expect to make a proper contribution to those activities. We're in a slightly strange position at the moment as a country because clearly the economy is doing better than a lot of people, including yourself, thought it would be doing at this point after the Brexit referendum vote. And yet, in, public, in the public sector, across the public spending curve, people are screaming with pain at the moment. And so can I ask you in particular about social care, which has become a really, really big political problem, not just for the government, for the whole country. Um, are you going to do something for social care? But more importantly, do we need to think about this entirely differently? Well, first of all, as you said, the economy is uh, performing extremely well, much better than uh, many uh, people uh, projected uh, that it would, and that's extremely good news. It gives the Prime Minister a very strong hand uh, as she goes into the Brexit negotiations. But we recognise that uh, our public services are under pressure to deliver the efficiency uh, agenda that we've uh, set out. And I recognise in particular uh, that social care and local authorities delivering social care are under some pressure. But this isn't just about money. We should remember that there are uh, many authorities managing extremely well. There are many examples around the country of extremely good working between the NHS and social care mm. authorities. Just 24 local authorities account for 50% of all the delayed discharges from the NHS. So it's about good practice as it's well as about budgets. It is also about budgets, as you know. Conservative councils are looking to put up council tax to, to meet the, the, the social care obligations. So I ask again, is this not something that as a country we need to think again about how we fund? Because you know, the country is getting older, we're all getting older, the social care bill is just going to go up and up and up and budget after budget, you know, sticking plaster solutions may not be enough. Well, I think there is a case for a longer term, taking a longer term view of how we fund a service which is um, intrinsically linked to the demographic profile of the population. And we know that we are an ageing uh, society, so the demands of social care for the elderly are going to get uh, greater um, in the future. And yes, there's a very good uh, case for taking a strategic look in the round uh, at how we deal with this problem over the longer term. I think that is, is this a separate, something that you as a government I think, can review? I, I think that is a separate issue um, mm. from dealing with the short-term disparities that are occurring between areas that are coping very well uh, at present and other areas uh, that are struggling. We have to look at what the differences are there. Can I ask you about progressive politics? And whether after this budget has been delivered and the number crunches have poured all over it, they will be saying yet again, this is actually a regressive budget. You'll have seen the Resolution Foundation curve, which shows that people at the bottom of the heap, they're just about managing, that this government said it was going to be in favour of and working for, are going to have a really tough time in terms of their incomes over the remaining years of this Parliament. 
Well, first of all, I don't recognise uh, these numbers. Various bodies publish various numbers which exclude um, certain things. Uh, what we look at, the Treasury looks at, is the effect overall of tax, spending, benefits, targeted public spending on different mm. groups. And there are some um, taking huge... taking all of that information there are, into account, well, Resolution with, Foundation. With, with, with respect, most of these figures do not take uh, all of this information into account. For example, um, the IFS excludes both the top yeah. and the bottom 3% uh, of the income distribution. It doesn't include uh, all areas of taxation. It doesn't include all areas uh, of government spending. But there are some very big steps about to happen uh, as we go into 2017-18. Uh, we've got a further uh, step uh, of increase in the personal allowance, which takes more people okay. out of paying well, income tax. Can I just tax. say very gently... We've got the, a the big program of investment in childcare. The government, by the time this program is rolled out, the government will be spending £6 billion a year uh, on free and tax-free childcare uh, for families across Britain, that's a huge boost to real family incomes. The Resolution Foundation takes both of those things into account when it shows that people at the bottom heap are going to get poorer and considerably poorer by 15 or 16 percent during the course of this government. Isn't John McDonald right to say that there needs to be a national pay increase? You need to look again at the living wage and raise well, that. Uh, with the greatest respect to John McDonald, we delivered uh, the national living wage. We've delivered that pay increase. And anybody who is on the national living wage uh, over the last two years, by the, by the time of the next increase to £7.50 in April, will be receiving £1,400 a year if they're in full-time uh, work, more than they were earning two years ago. So we've seen actually people at the bottom of the income distribution, the bottom fifth, seeing the biggest increase uh, in real wages uh, in the last uh, uh, data that's available. The other thing that you could do is reverse the cuts to universal credit. Uh, Ian Duncan Smith, no less, called for this. And a lot of people think this is simply something that is unfair to people who are doing their damnedest, working very, very hard, going out to work, and are yet being penalised by the government quite hard. Well, at the uh, autumn statement, you'll remember that we did uh, reduce the taper rate in universal credit from 65% to 63%. That's an income boost for 3 million uh, people on low incomes. But th there's always this Can challenge. Can you do more, do you think? There's always this challenge. If you have a generous... Uh, system of benefits for people as they move into work somehow you have to taper um, those benefits away and getting that right is, is always um, a challenge but obviously it's something we will keep uh, under review in the future. Same sort of question about the cuts to the disabled or the, 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 the lack of increase for disability. A lot of people think that is a particularly cruel, that £3.7 billion uh, shift is a particularly cruel thing to be doing. Well, this isn't a shift at all. Um, the government uh, was very clear about the policy intention. Uh, a court um, has found the policy, uh, the, the legislation, lacking in clarity. And what the DWP Secretary of State has decided to do is to legislate, to be absolutely clear about the original intention of Parliament. But nobody's going to lose any benefit here. There is nobody with a benefit award going who is to going to lose it going uh, to as a result of this. Mm. But this is um, a, a large amount of money which is part of the benefit reforms that we'd already announced and we've said very clearly we have no plans for further benefit reforms during this Parliament. But in order to make that statement we do have to be clear that we have to deliver the benefit reforms that have already been announced and legislated for. You've talked a little bit about Brexit. Can I ask you about something you said in Germany about what might happen if we don't get a deal. And I can read this out to people. Um, you talked about um, you want to remain in a recognisably European-style economy with European-style taxation, etc. But if we are forced to take something different, then we will, be, we will become something different. We could be forced to change our economic model. The British people are not going to lie down and say, too bad, we've been wounded. What is the alternative economic model that you're talking about there? Well, first of all, I'm very clear there, and the Prime Minister's been very clear, that we want to do a deal with the European Union, yes. we expect to do a deal with the European Union that will allow us to continue Un trading together uh, and allow our economy to remain recognisably um, in the European mainstream. The point I was simply making is that if there's anybody um, in the European Union uh, who thinks that if uh, we don't do a deal with the European Union, if we don't continue to work closely together, Britain will simply 
um, you know, slink off as a wounded animal. That is not going to happen. So what British people instead? have a great fighting spirit, and we will fight back. We will forge new trade deals around the world. We will build our business uh, globally. Uh, we will go on from strength to strength, and we will do whatever we need to do to make the British economy competitive and to make sure that this country uh, is a great, has a great and successful future. Because when you say we'll do whatever we need to do, a lot of people read that as we'll slash corporation taxes, we'll go to a, a low tax, low regulation, Singaporean style of economy. Well, people can read what they like into it. I'm not going to speculate now on how the UK uh, would respond to what I don't expect to be um, the outcome. But we are going into a negotiation. Uh, we expect to be able to achieve uh, a comprehensive free trade uh, deal with right. our European Union sure. partners, but they should know uh, that the alternative isn't Britain just slinking away into a corner. A lot of this is about the tone of the negotiation. Um, don't you think the government would be much wiser and shrewder to accept what the Lords has done on the status of EU nationals and allow that to be on the face of the bill? Because that's a way that you can get goodwill and start these negotiations off in the best possible spirit. Well, I think we already have goodwill and we've already been very clear with our European partners that we are willing to settle this issue right up front um, in the negotiation. It isn't us that has uh, refused to take this matter offline and deal with it reciprocally um, at an early stage. It's other members of the European Union that didn't want to take it out and deal with it separately. We are very clear. We want a deal on citizens and we want a deal that's fair both to EU citizens in the UK and to British citizens living in Europe. OK, can I ask you about a couple of other things? How worried are you that Northern Ireland is going to break away from the United Kingdom as a result of the elections and as a result of their enthusiasm for staying inside the single market like Scotland? Well, I, I, the, the union is extremely important to all of us, um, but Northern Ireland in particular benefits hugely uh, from the union uh, of the United Kingdom. Uh, Northern Ireland has four times um, as much trade with the UK as it does uh, with the Republic of Ireland, so the union is vitally important economically, but it's much more than just an economic issue. This union has made us strong and successful over many, many years, and the union okay. of England, Scotland, Wales uh, and Northern Ireland will go on driving that strength and success in the future. Channel 4 News have done sterling work in pursuing the Conservative Party about election irregularities. Do you think you're going to face by-elections as a result of what's coming? Well, I, the, the, the party uh, has already acknowledged that we made an administrative error uh, in the way some of the returns were made. Mm. In fact, we drew that uh, error to the attention uh, of the Electoral Commission and the due process has to be um, followed through and we will cooperate fully with the Electoral Commission in doing that. John McDonnell wants you to publish your tax return, will you? No, I have no intention of doing so. Um, just for the record, my tax affairs are all perfectly regular and up to date. But I think this, um, uh, this, David Cameron demon did, this demonstration mm -hmm. politics isn't uh, helping uh, to create a better atmosphere in British politics. And I note that the Labour Party uh, is now proposing a policy that anybody earning over a million pounds, which uh, I, as a cabinet minister, certainly am not, um, will have to publish uh, their tax returns, uh, make them public. Mm -hmm. That is likely to drive away talent and investors that Britain needs to create the global future that we're trying to build. Philip Hammond, thanks very Thank much you. indeed for talking to us. So it's budget week on Wednesday. Uh, Philip Hammond will deliver his second financial statement as Chancellor and the last spring budget for a while at least. They're moving it to the autumn. There's been pressure on him to find more money for the health service, social care, schools, funding, prisons, welfare. The list goes on. But this morning the Chancellor insisted that he will not be using the proceeds of better than expected tax receipts to embark on a spending spree. What is being speculated on is whether uh, we might not have borrowed quite as much as mm, was sure. we were forecast uh, to borrow. And we'll see the actual uh, numbers uh, on Wednesday. But Andrew, if your bank uh, increases your credit card limit, uh, I don't think you feel obliged to go out and spend every last penny of it uh, immediately. Steve, uh, he's moving the budget to the autumn. He told us that in last year's autumn statement. So maybe on Wednesday it's going to be a bit more like a, it's a spring statement rather than a full-blown budget. Yeah, tinkering uh, pre-Brexit and in November he'll have a clearer idea, not totally, but a clearer idea of the impact of Brexit. And I suspect that will be the bigger event 
than this one. Um, and it looks as if there will be a bit of money here and there, small amounts, not enough in my view for social care and so on. And possibly a review of social care policy, familiar device, which rarely gets anywhere. I actually think he's got a bit more space to do more if he wanted to now because of the mm. politics. They're miles ahead in the polls, so he probably could do more, but it's not in his character. He's a cautious figure, and I expect this will be a cautious statement. So he keeps his powder dry on most things. He does some things, as Steve says, but he keeps it dry to establish November as the budget uh, uh, now. Uh, but also, as Steve says, he will know just how strong the economy has been this year by November and whether he needs to do some pump priming or whether everything's fine. Yes, I think he certainly feels it's too early uh, to make those sorts of judgments now. What seems to be quite striking is the amount of concern there is in number 10 and in the Treasury about the tone of this budget. So less about the actual figures and more about what message this is sending out to the rest of the world. So I think that uh, some senior MPs are calling it a kind of treading water budget. Mm. And Phil Hammond has got quite a difficult act to perform because he is instinctively rather cautious, or, or in fact very cautious and, and instinctively slightly gloomy, I think, about Brexit. Remember, he was a Remainer, but he doesn't want this budget to sound downbeat and he will be absolutely mauled if he does make it sound downbeat. So he has to inject a little bit of optimism and we may see that in the infrastructure spending plans. And he has some room to manoeuvre. The, uh, the deficit for the financial year ending in April, we now know, will not be as big as the OBR told us only three and a half months ago. Uh, that it would be. They added 12 billion on. It looks like they may take most of that 12 billion off again. He's under pressure from his own side to do something on social care and business rates. Mm. And I bet some Tory backbenchers wouldn't mind a little more money for the NHS as well. He's under huge pressure to do a whole load on a whole load, to be honest. There's not just social care, not just the maybe a billion to turn fix the short term problems. There's also, you know, how on earth do we pay for so many more old people, which I think you also hinted at this morning. There's NHS, there's potential, you know, defence spending with the rise of Russia, there's everything. But I think his words this morning, which is, I'm not going to spend potentially an extra 30 billion I might have by 2020 because of the improved economic growth uh, were very interesting not just talking about well we need to hold some back in case Brexit goes bad and I am a bit of a remainer as you remember mm -hmm. but also the very strong message I thought he sent to the EU 27 uh, there on the Andrew Marr program saying if you think Britain is gonna curl up into a corner and, and hide away licking its wounds you've got another thing coming in other words that 30 billion that he'll have extra in his pocket that we didn't think he might have a few months ago could be worth deploying on building up Britain huge tax cuts in case there is no deal. A war chest, if you like. He, he'll have more than 27 billion now. He laid aside 27 billion in the autumn statement. Uh, that's the margin by which if he tries to uh, um, get the structural deficit down, he would still have 27 billion. If the receipts are better than they forecast, which they are, there's some talk this morning that he'd have a war chest of 60 billion. Uh, and, of yeah. course, that money can as disappear. Mr. Osborne found out, can disappear as quickly yeah. as you find it. Yeah, but I think it's quite interesting. He clearly is planning not to go on a spending spree this Wednesday. But I think it's very interesting. In the FT the other day, David Laws, who was uh, Chief Secretary for about five minutes at the Treasury, but also <laughs> very enthusiastic about the original Osborne austerity programme, said, look, we've reached the limits to what is socially possible with this. Mm. And it's quite interesting. I think a consensus is beginning to emerge that he's going to have to spend some more money than he probably plans to this Wednesday. As Tom says, this is not just from Labour MPs, but from a lot of Conservative MPs as well. And people will wonder, when is this austerity going to come to an end? Because it just mm. seems to go on forever. Now, Brexit may have swept austerity from the front pages, but the deficit hasn't gone away and the government's still committed to reducing it. Just this week, Whitehall announced the government departments have been told to find another £3.5 billion worth of savings by 2020. Last November, the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility said the budget deficit would be £68 billion in the current financial year and would still be £17 billion by 2021-22. 
On Wednesday, the Chancellor is expected to announce that the 2016-17 deficit has come in much lower than the OBR forecast. Even so, the government is still aiming for the lowest level of public spending as a percentage of national income since 2003-04, coupled with an increase in the tax burden to its highest level since the 1980s. So spending cuts will continue, with reductions in day-to-day -day government spending accelerating, producing a real-terms cut of over £12 billion by 2019-20. But capital spending, investment on infrastructure like roads, hospitals, housing, is projected to grow, producing a £16 billion real-terms increase by 2021-22. The Chancellor's task on Wednesday is to keep these fiscal targets while finding some more money for areas under serious pressure, such as the NHS, social care and business rates. I'm joined now by Paul Johnson of the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Welcome back to the programme. Now, in last March's budget, March budget, the OBR predicted just over 2% economic growth for this year. By the autumn statement, in the wake of the Brexit vote, it downgraded that to 1.4 per cent. It's now expected to revise that back around to 2 per cent, as the Bank of England has again. It's back to the future, isn't it? It, it, it looks like we will get uh, a growth forecast for this year, not very different to where it was a year ago. Yeah. What the bank did when it revised its forecast there was to upgrade its forecast for the next year or two, but not change very much what it was thinking we would be in three or four years' time, which, of course, is what really matters, particularly for the public. But it finances. looked like the OBR made a mistake in downgrading the growth uh, in the autumn statement, which was only three months ago. Well, the OBR was actually more optimistic than nearly all the other forecasters and was certainly more optimistic <laughs> than the Bank so, of England back So it was in wrong, but does not November. as wrong as everybody uh, else. But I would be surprised if it significantly upgraded... Uh, we don't know. But if it significantly upgraded its growth forecast for the next three or four years, I would be quite surprised. But we'll just see if it gets 2017 right before we worry about 2018 or 19. It also added 12 billion to the deficit for the current financial year in the autumn statement compared with March. It looks like that deficit will be probably cut again by about 12 billion compared to the last OBR forecast. So, I mean, it's quite difficult to make economic policy on the basis of changes of that scale every couple of months. Uh, well, that's one of the problems about having these two uh, economic events so close oh, so together. Rid of them. But uh, you know, my guess is the number will come out actually somewhere between the budget and autumn statement numbers. There was a you know, very nice surprise for the Chancellor about a, last yeah. month. It looked like tax revenues were coming in quite a lot more strongly than... He expected, but again, the real question for him is how much is this making difference making in the medium run? Is this just a one-off thing or something that's going to be good news for the next several years? Well, if growth and revenues are stronger, perhaps not in a trend line as strong as the good news you referred to last month, but if they are stronger than had been forecast only in the autumn statement, what does that mean for planned spending cuts? Well, it probably doesn't mean very much. I mean, let's not forget the, the best the best possible outcome this budget will be that for the next year or two things look no worse than they did a year ago and do three or four years out they'll still look a, a bit worse and in addition uh, Mr Hammond did actually increase his spending plans back in November so mm -hmm. however good the numbers look uh, in a couple of days time we're still going to be borrowing I would have thought at least 20 billion more by 2020 than we were forecasting a so year ago. So still quite a tight con con constraint. Well, of course, uh, Philip Hammond has said um, George Osborne wanted us to get us to budget surplus by 2019. That's Philip, gone. Philip Hammond said, "Not interested in that. I'm actually happy with quite a big deficit um, in those years." But I think what he's thinking, to a large extent, is, you know, as you as you've just been making absolutely clear. There's an awful lot of uncertainty about mm. the economic direction over the next three or four years. And I think what he was doing was saying, I want some headroom. If things do go wrong, I don't want to have to announce more spending cuts or more tax rises so, to keep the deficit so down. What I want to be able to do is say, well, look, things have gone wrong for now and we'll just be But I've got some more. money in the kitty, yeah, if, so if he's, need be. He, he's not going to spend a lot of it now. He wants some headroom. One final thing. I, I understand the Chancellor is increasingly worried about the erosion of the tax base that it's hard to put VAT up more than the 20% it is at the moment. Millions have been taken out of income tax. Only, I think, about 46% of people now pay income tax. Fuel duties seem to be frozen forever. Corporation tax is being cut. The growth in self-employed has reduced revenues. Is that a real concern? 
these are all worries for him. It's, it's very, we, we, we have, as you said in the um, introduction to this part, actually got a tax uh, burden which is rising mm. very, very gradually, but it's rising to its highest level since the mid-1980s, but it's not doing it through straightforward increases to income tax and VAT and so on. It's lots of bits and pieces, pieces. and insurance premium tax there, here, an apprenticeship levy there, and we are losing money from a combination of a much higher um, personal allowance in income tax, freezing fuel duties, as you said, year after year. At some point, we are going to have to look at the tax system as a whole and ask, can we really carry on like this? Are we not going to have to do something to income tax, start increasing fuel duties again, or look, you know, look to those big but unpopular taxes to really keep that money coming in to keep to the, you know, the, 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 the challenges right. we're going to have over the next 30 years. Well, he's going to, apparently to set up a commission on social care, so maybe we'll get a commission well, on the tax base We've as well. had quite a few commissions on <laughs> social care. We always have had, I know. <laughs> Paul Johnson, thank you for being with us. I've been getting away.